Good day, Moto Buddies. What's going on? Derek Harris here, HP Race Development in the house. I got a great video coming at you. I wanted to show you some inside secrets to suspension. So this happens to be the 2022 Honda CRF 250R fork. There's a cartridge over there, that long piece. Here's the cartridge damping rod. This is where your mid-valve goes, right here. This is the rebound adjusting rod, right here. What that does is get turned by your adjuster at the bottom of the bike. That turns this rod. That rod then turns a needle that goes inside of right here. It's a tapered needle. It sticks up like this. And when you turn the adjuster in, the needle goes this way. When you turn the adjuster out, the needle goes that way. See this little hole right here? The needle is blocking off fluid from coming in and out of that hole. So the fluid goes in the shaft in the center. There's a little hole there in that shaft, <clears throat> and it bypasses your mid-valve, which is right here. That is your mid-valve. Let's take a look at that. Okay. These ports on this side, those holes are where the fluid comes out on the compression stroke. The holes on this side are where the fluid come out on the rebound stroke. The rebound holes are a little bit smaller because the rebound velocities are considerably slower. They don't need as much area. So the rebound adjuster goes in and out. There's a little tapered needle inside. That tapered needle is what determines how much fluid can bypass your mid-valve piston, go completely around it, and just come in and out of that hole. The more area you have, the less damping you have. The less area you have, the more damping you have. If I said that correctly, hopefully. So at the end of the day, Here's a great question for you guys, and I want to challenge the status quo, media outlets swearing that this Showa fork is more sensitive to adjustments than the KYB fork. If you go watch another video of mine that happens to be on this channel, we'll put a link in the description, we have a KYB fork apart in its pieces. You can see the entire KYB fork, and I think, I haven't watched that video in a while, that we went over the exact same things as I'm doing in this video. So why don't you go make a determination for yourself if you can tell a difference between the parts and pieces. Oops. So as you see here, this is the mid-valve piston. It's a, I don't have to get the calipers out. I think off the top of my head, it's a 20 millimeter diameter. KYB is in the same boat. Now here's the base valve. Shims laid out. There's the actual base valve there. This bike uses a very large shaft, okay, on the base valve. Um, okay, so see the diameter of this shaft? That's very large. But back in the day, it was steel and they were a lot smaller. They were basically this size. And sometimes they would break in Supercross usage, which is crazy to me, but they certainly would. So anyway, um, let's go over a couple details. The base valve has got huge ports, okay? I mean, absolutely massive ports, okay? The valves are not restrictions at all on these motorcycles. So if you buy a gold valve, you're just buying bullshit. Sorry. Now, are you buying good products with gold valve? Yeah, of course. They give you great damping settings. What are damping settings? It's all these shims, guys. What do shims do? Well, in layman's terms, the more shims you have, the stiffer your bike will be. The less shims you have, the softer your fork will be. The thicker the shims are, the stiffer it will be. The thinner the shims are, the softer it will be. How you stack these is really not that important when it comes to tapering and stuff. Tapering is done purely for the reliability of the shims. I'm not going to go into details on that for this video. It's over most people's head. But essentially, these shims are bending a million times. They're just opening and closing and bending on themselves. That's how they work. So if you don't do the design of this taper correctly from big to small, then the shims get a stress point. So it's like bending a piece of paper over and over again on the same spot and the paper will break. So what they do is they distribute the bend all the way across the shims so that the shims last. So this is the mid-valve compression stack right here. Okay. There's a mount of float. There's a little spacer here. It goes inside this little cup washer, and these shims can move up or down freely with this little check spring right here. The amount of gap you have there is called float. The more gap you have, the softer your mid-valve is. The less gap you have, the stiffer your mid-valve is. Supercross settings use zero gap. They completely have no gap, no free gap. Motocross setups, depending over the years, have had a lot of gap, and nowadays they're getting less and less gap, making the suspension stiffer and stiffer over the years. This is the stiffest Honda 250 setting they've had in the last... I'd have to go look at my notes, but a long time, okay, since probably like 12 or 14, something like that. This is the stiffest fork Honda has done in quite some time. But it's the same parts and pieces as a KYB fork and as previous Showa forks, even though they're 49s, the internals are basically the same. Here's a rebound side, okay? More shims you have there, slower your rebound is. Less shims you have there, faster your rebound is. Not rocket science. Again, here's a mid-valve post, and then there's your cartridge. 
So one of the things I want you to do if you really want to take the time is I want you to go look at my other video on the KYB fork and we'll post a complete comparison video in the near future of all the forks. You're going to find that there's no real difference in design on the insides. They've basically copied each other. Showa used to have a twin chamber design that was really good going back to like 98 or 2000, 2001, I don't recall off the top of my head. KYB essentially copied that but improved it in 2006 and they really did improve it. Really good settings and design and then all of a sudden here came Honda with their Showaba fork. I think it was 2010 on the 250, and it was a Showa fork, but it was an identical clone to the KYB fork. And I mean identical. Every single piece of it was the same. If there was any difference in feel, it was all in shim stacks. It had nothing to do with design. Now, here's a cool fork over here. I wanted to show you this for this video. This is a WPAER mid-valve assembly. It's really big. As you can see, it's much bigger because they only have one fork doing damping. The other fork's the air. So they doubled up the size and they double up the damping in one fork so they can get the damping they want. As you can see, the rebound holes are kind of small. Compression holes, massive. Okay, but what do you know? Stem, post, cup, same fucking design. Excuse my language. Here's the mid-valve shim stack. I don't really have it shown well here for video, but there it is. Okay, tapered shims, lots of them. All right. They have a lot more shims on this one than they do on this, this other fork because it needs to be twice as stiff, so there's basically twice as many shims. There's more math to it. Because this piston's bigger, there's more fluid going through it. You don't actually theoretically need twice the shims, but there's some math behind that, and we could get into that at a later date. So this is uh, an overlay of these Showa forks. Thank you for watching. I want you guys to think about some things when you hear people say comments without any proof. Maybe you should start thinking about what those comments really are. So a Showa and a KYB fork have the exact same design here. They have a piston, excuse me, they have a needle that's tapered, and they have a rod. This is actually, I pulled it out just for this video. There's the KYB rod. Okay? Same thing. Here's the KYB adjuster. Okay? They're slightly different, but if you get inside of there, it looks the same as this. Okay? And it goes in and out, and it moves the rod up and down and pushes the needle in and out of the fork. So what determines how big a click difference is? Determines is the steepness of the taper of the needle. So let's say you had a more steeply tapered needle, then each click would be more sensitive. How does a compression adjuster work? Same thing. Fluid goes in that little hole in the center of that shaft. Okay, your clicker goes all the way through this thing. It's got a tapered needle. And if you see, there's some little bit of outlet holes right there. There's a bunch of them. Okay, that tapered needle is blocking off that fluid from escaping those holes. It goes in, it goes out, it blocks fluid or it opens up fluid. So the taper of that needle and the thread pitch is what determines how sensitive clicks are. And I'm just here to tell you guys a little secret that between KYB and Showa, pretty much the same. Now, why would they do that? Well, there's an amount of change that is necessary for you to feel it on the bike, right? Like, let's call it a 1% difference. So each manufacturer will want each click to do at minimum enough that you can feel it. But each manufacturer doesn't want each click to be so much that you can overdo it. So they're all doing about the same thing. And they all look at each other's parts and pieces, and they all are studying each other over the years. Now, at this point in the game, pretty much every single fork on the market is almost the same of one another. It should be no surprise to anybody because these guys are all converging on a very functional design. Now, the sad news for the industry is there's been no major technological advances in production forks in about 25 years. You can go back to 06, and this is what a 06 KYB fork looks like. Exact same. It uses the shims. It uses the exact same mid-valve designs. It uses the same cartridge rods. Same cartridge sizes, fluids, all the same stuff. But what has changed over the last 20 years has been stiffness and settings. Settings are much stiffer now than they were 20 years ago. And that reflects the bikes, the tracks, the riders, and our designs. Thank you for watching. All right, fellas, let's continue on our series of looking inside current Showa suspension components. This is off the 2022 Honda 250F CRF250R. So what we're looking at here is the shock disassembled. Here's the shock shaft. Uh, we're going to pull that apart and get the uh, bumper out, this little piece down in here. Uh, here's a seal head assembly. It's got a spring right here that is a um, top-out spring. These are actually influential in tuning. And then moving across. So this is the compression stack. This would be the bottom, last shim. And then it moves up. And this goes all the way to the piston right here. And then here's a rebound stack. That's on the piston. It goes down to the bottom there. Here's the piston. Right there, what you're looking at on this side is the rebound holes, and this side is the compression holes. Now, we're going to pull apart a sh KYB shock here in the near future, and we'll put a comparison video up, and you can check out the differences between 
the shocks, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be hard pressed to see any visual difference. They're the same. There are some small differences in, in uh, designs, but not big. And really comes down to how you arrange these shims, the linkage ratio of your bike, the spring rate selection, the tuning, and the chassis. The chassis plays a bigger role in performance than the actual damping settings. Here's some fun fact for you guys. The rebound setting on Showa shocks, going back to as far as I've been in business, so like designs that we've seen since like 03, 04, 05, 06, really hasn't changed. This stack is pretty much the same that Honda has run for a long, long time. Off the top of my head, I think for a long while, there's only three of these shims and there wasn't four. Now there's four. One shim is not the biggest difference in the world in that particular category and the thicknesses and tapers of this have stayed the same for a long time. This piston design has not changed for Honda in a long, long, long time. And um, they have changed compression settings over the years a little bit. But realistically, if you were to go look at a shock in 2006 from Honda and laid it out with this shock, you wouldn't see a big, big difference. So it's something, something to keep in mind for you guys out there. You keep thinking that everything progresses every year. Things don't really progress every year. Now, there are changes in linkage ratios and there's changes in spring rates and chassis and little odds and ends that do differ. But for the most part, the meat and potatoes of this suspension industry has not changed in a long, long time.